Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled The Future of Medical Devices: How COVID-19 and the Rise of Digital Health Has Changed Regulatory, Clinical, and Reimbursement Dynamics in the Medical Device Industry. Hello, my name is Sonia Hunt and it's my pleasure to be your X Talks moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel and that's found on the right hand side of your screen. If you require assistance, please do not hesitate to contact me at any time by sending me a message using that chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank MCRA who developed the content for this presentation. MCRA is a leading medical device advisory firm and clinical research organization, CRO. MCRA's value contribution rests within its industry experience at integrating five business value creators, regulatory, reimbursement, clinical research, healthcare compliance, and quality assurance to provide a dynamic, market-leading effort from concept to commercialization. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to one of your speakers for today's event, and that is Glenn Stegman, Senior Vice President, Clinical and Regulatory Affairs with MCRA. Glenn is a former FDA Chief of the Orthopedic Devices Branch with 20 plus years of regulatory experience. The regulatory team has supported over 450 projects in the past year and has overseen MCRA Regulatory Department with 13 out of 13 unblemished PMA record. And now it's my pleasure to pass over the mic to Glenn to introduce the rest of the speakers. So Glenn, when you're ready, you may begin. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. A slide. The rise of digital health innovation and how it's changed regulatory and clinical reimbursement during this COVID-19 pandemic is on everyone's mind. As the life sciences industry works to contain the global pandemic, it is clear that the dynamics of the medical device and digital health industries are being disrupted. Hopefully this presentation sheds some light on the various changes and opportunities we have seen during this time. Next. We have several presenters today, as Sonia mentioned, but first an overview of the topics that will be covered. First, the brief background of MICRA, then I'll turn it over to Nikki Batista for the topic of digital health, then Lauren Craig will discuss reimbursement followed by Michael John will discuss creative clinical study designs, and lastly, Iman Emmett will discuss trends on clinical studies and going virtual. Next. Here are the bios of my colleagues that will be presenting today. They represent the experts in their field, and at the beginning of each section, we will introduce them. As mentioned, I am Glenn Steigman. I'm Senior Vice President of Clinical and Regulatory Affairs at MICRA. I've been with MICRA for almost 15 years. Prior to joining MICRA, I was the branch chief of orthopedics and also served as team leader in other areas of the FDA, such as peripheral vascular branch. Over the last year, MICRA has supported almost 500 regulatory projects, including PMAs, IDEs, INDs, de novos, and 510Ks, among others, as well as the management of dozens of clinical studies. Next. So a little about MICRA. We were started about 16 years ago under the idea that in order for any medical device company to create value, they needed several things. First, you would need to successfully navigate the tumultuous environment of the FDA. Second, collect clinical data either for regulatory purposes or marketing purposes. And combining a successful reimbursement strategy with the regulatory, clinical, and along with quality assurance and compliance, we believe you had the primary tools to successfully market and sell your device. Ultimately, a one-stop shop for any company developing innovative FDA-regulated technology. Next. 
One of our core philosophies is to understand a therapeutic space before starting to provide counsel in that area. We have worked hard on understanding the history, the precedent, the environment of each therapeutic area and hire the best possible people to lead these areas. We started the musculoskeletal and spine, but with innovation, we've made the natural progression to biologics, combination products, and have since moved into wound therapy and cardiovascular devices. Next. Now we've seen headline after headline about the impact of coronavirus. We've seen the stock market go up and down, recover, reset, plummet and repeat again. We've seen probably firsthand the impact on sales and revenue, the incredible tough decisions to furlough employees, and certainly as a consulting firm, new and exciting projects being postponed. The impact on hospitals are even more dramatic with the halting of elective surgeries. Then as the curve flattened going back to elective surgeries, and now hospitals are starting again to stop elective surgeries in some of the nation's hotspots. This only continues the trend of lost revenue, which has resulted in over 300 billion lost hospitals furloughing those needed healthcare employees and possibly even shutting down. The patient effect is also impacted. Approximately 90% decline in things such as preventive cancer screening and insurance companies looking to save costs. While there continue to be a climbing infection rates across the U.S., we are attempting to push through this pandemic in a safe and cautious way, but things will never be back to normal. But with the last three to four months imprinted on our brain for the rest of our lives, the corporations and manufacturers have been thinking outside the box, initially thinking of innovative and creative ways to provide PPEs or ventilators in the creation of and implementation of telemedicine. While this is something that is necessary now, what we have shown is that we have a true, truly viable method of care for our future. We need to look at this pandemic as an opportunity to kickstart wishful ideas and making them a reality. Next. One of the biggest headlines from this pandemic was the stoppage of elective surgery. Over 28 million procedures were canceled, which eliminates the revenue generated from approximately 45 minutes of that recovery time. This, as shown on the, on the slide prior, is how hospitals are losing millions of dollars and having to lay off their valuable staff. The hardest hit was orthopedics and spine. There are a lot of other victims with cancellation and elimination of elective surgeries, including cardiovascular procedures. However, across the board, companies are thinking of innovative ways to change the way they conduct business and how to embrace, embrace the trends of digital health with their own devices. Companies are thinking about the clinical program and how to turn their studies to become more virtual and how to develop and optimize a reimbursement strategy for their new innovative product. Going virtual is the new normal, and executives of med tech and healthcare businesses and their investors need to develop their strategies for navigating their way through this evolving landscape. Next. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Nikki Batista, who came to Nicker as an FDA reviewer and former assistant director of the external heart rhythm and rate device team, in which she was able to gather extensive knowledge on digital health and medical device regulation. Nikki? Thank you, Glenn. I'm going to briefly walk us through the framework of digital health technology and its ecosystem. Next slide. So before my colleagues dig into examples of its implementation, I'd like to provide some context to what digital health technologies might look like. While there's no single definition uh, for what digital health is, it's reasonable to think of digital health as a dynamic network of technologies that eliminate the traditional boundaries of healthcare as shown on this slide. Next slide. There are several important stakeholders that drive the direction and implementation of digital health as shown here. As Glenn mentioned, the development and use of digital health technologies has steadily been increasing since its emergence, and the current environment is only accelerating its timeline for growth and adoption. Next slide. So it's really important to identify the differences between FDA regulated and FDA non-regulated digital health technologies as it greatly impacts the journey to commercialization. 
To determine this, there are two really important considerations to keep in mind when evaluating whether a digital health technology is regulated by the agency. So the first one is, does it meet the definition of a medical device per Section 201H of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act? So that is, is it intended to diagnose, cure, mitigate, treat, or prevent a disease or condition? And if so, are there any aspects of your technology that are exempt from FDA regulatory oversight? For example, the 21st Century Cures Act eliminated FDA's mandate to enforce compliance for certain types of technologies that meet specific criteria, such as clinical decision support or medical data or medical device data systems. As you can imagine, this second question, the second step, must be taken on a case-by-case -case basis, and MICRA has extensive experience supporting developers in conducting these analyses. So I'd like to take the next few moments to highlight two of these technologies as it sets up for next topic. Next slide. So telehealth broadly refers to electronic and telecommunication technologies used to provide remote care and services and can include non-clinical services. While telemedicine is a specific type of telehealth that refers to remote clinical services, including video conferencing, transmission of patient data, and remote monitoring, which will be discussed in detail later on. Next slide. So it might be challenging to imagine what some of these regulated devices could be and how they could be integrated into uh, the continuum of patient care. So this slide lists examples of FDA-regulated devices that range from those with hardware and software components that measure basic physiological parameters like blood pressure to those that monitor and manage specific diseases to those that are comprehensive remote medical exams. So with minimal footprints on our daily lives, a well-designed and implemented digital health medical device has the potential to reduce healthcare costs, increase healthcare quality, reduce healthcare inefficiencies, empower patients to take an active role in their health, and better inform healthcare practitioners, just to name a few. Next slide. As you may know, the FDA releases guidance documents which outline their interpretations of various regulations and policies which are used by industry to strategize their regulatory pathway. You may also know that the traditional guidance document process can take years to release them in even just draft form and even more years to finalize. So the fact that FDA has released nearly 50 guidance documents in the span of only a few months in response to COVID-19 is wildly shocking, but also encouraging. Of these documents, I wanted to bring four of them to your attention as they outline enforcement policies that expand the availability of digital health products while reducing the exposure to COVID-19 during the pandemic. Next slide. So these enforcement policies outline the, uh, what may be released directly to users without FDA pre-market review. These four enforcement policies are for devices that range in intended use and in their permissibility. That is to say the enforcement policy for, for example, non-invasive remote monitoring devices used to support patient monitoring is limited to those which are already FDA cleared and meet the or and or meet the criteria of clinical decision support, which is not subjected to FDA regulation. While on the contrary, we have an enforcement policy for digital health devices for treating psychiatric disorders like computerized behavioral therapy that can be brand new to the market. That being said, it's really important to know that these enforcement policies are only valid during the declared public health emergency. So if you're using one of these enforcement policies to bring a new or modified device to market, you must be asking yourself, what am I doing right now to collect the necessary information and data to support a permanent marketing strategy if that is what you'd like to pursue? Because once the public health emergency is declared to be over, these devices must be removed from the field. Next slide. So digital health innovation has been on the rise for years. And the current climate, as I said, has catapulted its demand. 
So what does the future of digital health look like? I think every minute of every day, our bodies are telling a story and through the, through the use of biometric monitoring, patients and doctors will be able to read these stories in a way we never could before. And the clarity of these stories rely on the data quality and interoperability of um, them with existing devices and systems. Next, the, clinic, or the chronic disease management realm will reap the benefits of digital health advancement. As shown on the previous slide, there are devices used right now to remotely manage and monitor diseases like diabetes, sleep apnea, and cardiac arrhythmias. And we can only expect the number of chronic diseases to be managed and monitored remotely to increase as big data analytics, cloud computing, and predictive algorithms are developed and deployed. The use of chronic disease management devices and biometric monitoring will transform the patient-doctor interaction. We can expect a hybrid of in-clinic and telemedicine visits to become the new normal. The value of an in-clinic visit will never be replaced with a telemedicine visit, but there are several instances where telemedicine can be appropriately used to alleviate the burden of traveling to a clinic and thereby expanding patient access to expert clinical care teams around the world and improve healthcare facility and efficiencies. When combined with the use of digital health devices, patient-doctor interactions will become more focused and informed. The days of clinical transactions are over and digital health technologies are now generating a new wave of ongoing collaboration with patients and clinicians. But in order for clinical care continuum to truly benefit from digital health, it's critical that these technologies are seamlessly integrated into the IT infrastructures at healthcare facilities. Interestingly, in a survey conducted by the VA, 85% of the Heart Rhythm Society participants reported a lack in infrastructure to support digital health use. This, integra uh, this integration will be accelerated as it demand continues to rise, and manufacturers of digital health technologies must find solutions and partnerships with healthcare IT vendors to facilitate that. And last, but certainly not least, I wanted to highlight that in order for all digital health technology to operate safely and smoothly, cybersecurity is a pillar in its design and innovation. As the most targeted industry accounting for 41% of all cyber attacks in 2008, or sorry, 2018, um, the healthcare sector has spent hundreds of millions of dollars in cyber attack recovery. And the strength of cybersecurity will dictate if healthcare continu can continue in its digital transformation at a fast pace. Next slide. I will now turn it over my, to my colleague, Lauren Craig, who is a member of our reimbursement and market access team. She has over 15 years of experience developing reimbursement and sales strategies to support successful new product launches. Lauren? Great, thanks so much, Nicole, I appreciate it. Um, hello, everyone. Um, we're going to review today just a little bit about reimbursement planning for new technologies. We'll look at the perspectives from different stakeholders, talk a little bit about the work that the American Telemedicine Association is, has completed, and then talk a little bit more about the policies that the AMA and CMS have come together on in order to expand um, access to telemedicine and digital health devices. Next slide, please. So when you're considering reimbursement, there are really two path pathways for new technologies. Um, and one should really consider coverage, coding, and payment together. Most new devices and technologies, such as implantables or alternatives to the current standard of care, will require new code and payment pathways. And these pathways require typically a significant upfront investment in order to prove out the technology's effectiveness and then also to establish payer coverage. For digital health and telemedicine, coding and payment often is included within existing payment pathways. These uh, devices or procedures or services can be reimbursed or bundled within two existing payments. And the manufacturer should really consider current reimbursement pathways and also new reimbursement pathways to inform their go-to market strategies and pricing and acquisition models. It's essential to establish a new and separate reimbursement pathway um, 
and also to make sure that this is an evidence-based process. Next slide. So when considering these three items, coding, coverage, and payment, um, technology innovators should really flesh out the strategic intent of the product in order to development, to in order to develop and plan accordingly. Um, the unmet need of the product or service or procedure should really be well identified. In this realm, you really want to understand where the product fits in the treatment continuum and how it could potentially disrupt current care pathways. Some companies actually spend two to three years studying the market, surgical techniques that currently exist for new procedures, and then also current procedure flows. And if time is of the essence, it could be even more of a reason to work with those that are already experienced in these landscapes because these nuances in um, different procedures and, and workflow patterns can really help um, understand how your product really will help kind of disrupt the current treatment continuum. And that leads directly to understanding the reimbursement implications. Next slide. So often we think reimbursement and market access processes in the US are linear, and in fact, they're not. Once products receive FDA approval and also then CMS approval, it's basically a green light to the maze of reimbursement and market access. Next slide. And I thought this was a great depiction of kind of, you know, where you can uh, find yourself <laughs> once you kind of um, embark on the next uh, phase of your journey. So um, product FDA approval and then kind of the, the CMS stamp of approval will often lead you to this next, next maze of reimbursement. Next slide. Now, not only will you need to consider your own product within this uh, maze of reimbursement, but there are multiple stakeholders involved that can um, help ensure your product's market adoption. And these multiple stakeholders can have competing priorities. They can have varying objectives and they can receive influence from uh, different sources. Their agendas can also be different and the timing of those agendas can be very important. So the role of each stakeholder should be considered when determining their relevance and the level of influence they will have on your market access plan for your technology. Five of these um, probably more important stakeholders are the patients, the providers, the payers, the health technology assessments, and then the employer groups. So with patients, you really want to consider, you know, have you surveyed enough of them to really validate the value of your technology that you're going to bring to them with the planned indication? With providers, you're really looking at, you know, the physicians and then facility administrators that will be making decisions. And it's important to understand your technology's impact on their workflow, the payments received, and then what types of organizational structures you potentially are selling into. Payers can often be incentivized by financial risk reduction. So they may have different risk arrangements and partnerships with different facilities that may necessitate different strategies. And, and sometimes these strategies can be competing. Health technology assessments can evaluate your, your technology um, for different reasons. And it's important to understand the influence these health technology assessments can have on the adoption of your technologies and also how these health technology assessments are evolving. For instance, there are a number of new um, technology companies such as Lumiere that are really looking at, you know, providing more insights and data into these assessments. And then finally, employers, you know, these employers are, are still the largest purchasers of healthcare. And we want to make sure that we're providing um, technologies that really address the needs of their um, employees. Uh, next slide. So the FDA, the payers, and the providers can all have uh, different requirements. For instance, the FDA's primary objective is to evaluate the device and to discuss and decide whether the benefits of that device outweigh the risks. They really want to see efficacy. 
Our payers, on the other hand, are evaluating the impact that the, that the device can have on health outcomes and also the demonstrated effectiveness of that device or procedure. The improved benefits um, will really define whether or not this device or procedure should be considered over the established alternatives or the standard of care that exists in the market. And typically payers like to see published evidence to inform their decision making. Facilities, on the other hand, may want to evaluate the clinical benefits for patients and understand the overall financial impact to their particular facility. So whereas payers may look at your device or technology from one lens, healthcare systems and those providers may have another lens that they're looking at. And often, sometimes the providers within those healthcare systems may have a different lens from those that are actually looking at the overall health of the health systems organization. So an end-to-end -end evidence generation strategy really is necessary to meet all stakeholder requirements. Next slide. The key reimbursement fundamentals that we discussed, payment, coding, and coverage, are all interrelated. They're, they are not interdependent, and they really should be considered together when forming an evidence-based strategy. Next slide. And I think that we can all agree that the um, coronavirus pandemic has really um, provided an opportunity to explain the way um, all of these decision makers interact to um, create market access for, for new technologies that can really help speed innovation and access to care. So while the AMA and, and CMS had, had begun to start implement policy to pay for telemedicine and digital health, the events of this year really forced quicker adoption of these policies and these technologies by providers. And these policies will continue to develop over time. Um, more than likely in favor of digital and, and telemedicine. And this will really open opportunities for medical innovators. In fact, about three years ago, the AMA had already created the Digital Medicine Payment Advisory Work Group to help improve the adoption of digital medicine. And you can imagine that the discussions that occurred three years ago and the discussions that will occur at the end of this year will, will be probably vastly different. So, um, it's, it's good to know that CMS had already started covering several digital health services in 29. However, with implementation of many waivers um, with the coronavirus pandemic, this really provided an opportune time to revisit those policies that had been put in place in order to expand access for patients to um, benefit from having more of these digital health services um, available. Next slide, please. So the pandemic has really changed the landscape for digital health and te telemedicine. Um, as we can see, the waiver 1135 really allowed telehealth services to flow in all areas of the country, whereas prior to 2020, this was limited to rural areas. Um, and then most importantly, the payment values associated with the codes that were um, developed for these technologies were um, <clears throat> equated to the same amount of reimbursement that had been provided for standard office visits within traditional med medical uh, care settings. So whereas before uh, providers were potentially not financially incentivized to um, promote the utilization of, of digital health with their patients, um, now the reimbursement playing fields is level and advocacy is already underway um, to ensure that the payments will remain um, permanent uh, past the pandemic. Next slide, please. Great, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Michael John. He's our Vice President of Cardiovascular and Regulatory Affairs. He was the former FDA Chief of the Interventional Cardiology Devices Branch. He has over 20 plus years of cardiovascular experience and has consulted for over 25 cardiovascular companies. Most importantly, he has overseen the approval of all five drug eluting stents in the U.S. market, and he's very experienced in um, the innovations that are required uh, for a cardiovascular trial design. Michael? Thanks, Lauren. Uh, my name is Mike John. I'm the Vice President of Cardiovascular Regulatory Affairs at MICRA. 
And over the next few slides, I'll be touching on some of the ongoing initiatives at FDA to promote innovation in clinical trial design and the regulation of novel medical devices. So cardiovascular devices were chosen as a narrative for this discussion, given that they have historically had some of the larger and more resource intensive trials in the device space. But the core principles of what we'll discuss today apply across all devices regulated by the agency. Next slide, please. To provide some context, uh, the cost of clinical trials has increased dramatically over the last decade. These are data from drug studies illustrating that the cost for a top 12 pharma company to get a drug approved in the U.S. have grown from about $1.2 billion in 2010 to $2 billion in 2017. Next slide, please. So what does this mean? Well, if you contrast the rising cost of studies with the declining revenue that many companies are experiencing in the current climate, it's clear to see that there are real challenges in generating high quality data that also satisfies regulatory expectations. And this is why creativity in trial design is needed now uh, more than ever, because companies need to find ways to minimize costs and create value while still adhering to the core principles of, of any good device company which are to continue to drive innovation and maintain high scientific and clinical rigor and bring a new product to the market. Next slide. So these challenges are uniquely pronounced in the cardiovascular space, as the vast majority of PMAs in the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health are in fact cardiovascular. The statutory requirement for PMA approval hinges on submission of valid scientific evidence, which, quote, shall consist of well-controlled investigations or trials. As a result, there are a large number of trials in the cardiovascular space, trials which are both cost and time intensive. As we've discussed previously, that paradigm has become increasingly difficult for many companies to operate within, and the FDA has recognized that challenge um, by endorsing a number of innovative strategies for trial design, all of which underscore a focus on a, a key regulatory concept called least burdensome principles, uh, which is defined as, quote, the minimum amount of information necessary to adequately address a regulatory question or issue through the most efficient manner at the right time. Next slide, please. Displayed here are some of the key innovations in trial, de trial design and device regulation, uh, the first on the left being adaptive trial design. The fundamental principle being that instead of all the study parameters being fixed at the start of the study, many aspects of the trial can be modified during the study as information on the subject accumulates. This can involve inclusion of prior data in the design as occurs with Bayesian statistics or early termination, sample size re-estimation, or different allocation of patients to treatment groups if the benefits or hazards observed during the study warrant those changes. The agency has also been permitting use of real-world evidence to address the need for clinical data, which can constitute data collected outside of conventional FDA trials from registries or even from CMS data. Single-arm studies are accepted in certain cases, such as when the technology being investigated is fairly mature, or in unique circumstances, you know, there is actually no pre-market trial at all, uh, as many of the regulatory questions can be addressed through robust animal testing or even in the post-market. Also of note on the right, the Breakthrough Device Program is an important type of regulatory innovation that's become quite popular recently. It involves many of the same options for trial design, in addition to other more administrative benefits, such as increased access to the review branch, which can dramatically streamline the regulatory process overall. Next slide. So to, to sort of bring all these concepts home, here's a, a tale of two approvals for the Edward Sapien device. So this is a transcatheter aortic replacement heart valve, uh, which some have called the most revolutionary interventional cardiology device developed in the past decade. Uh, in total, there were three trials totaling about 458 patients to get that device approved in 2011. The partners program in general is much larger than even that, that number. Um, but that was due in large part uh, to the high regulatory bar the U.S. had, um, which led to that device, uh, to the U.S. being the 42nd country to make that product available. And if you contrast that with 2017, when the indication was expanded to the use of the valve and valve option in the mitral location, which is a very complex anatomical target and a complex clinical, clinical scenario, you know, despite the novelty of that indication, that approval required no prospective clinical data all of the information was obtained from the registry, which is a, a striking example of FDA's evolving perspective on the requirements for valid scientific evidence. And with that, I will hand it over to Iman Emmett to discuss the logistics of a new type of clinical trial design. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everyone. 
During this next segment of our presentation, I'll be talking about how the rise of digital health and telemedicine has led to the possibility of decentralized clinical trials. Also referred to as remote clinical trials or virtual trials, these types of studies have taken center stage in recent months due to COVID-19 as the medical device industry continues to experience clinical research restrictions due to state and local safety guidelines. Next slide, please. As many of you may know, the regulatory approval pathway for pharmaceuticals and medical devices differs significantly. Unlike pharma, which has a fixed progression from phase one to phase two, and then on to phase three, medical devices have multiple regulatory pathways for approval. Each device's risk category and novelty drives the type of regulatory submission and the number and nature of clinical studies that need to be conducted for FDA. High-risk devices such as coronary stents, pacemakers, and orthopedic implants are classified as class three devices and require a PMA submission, which typically calls for a small feasibility study followed by a larger pivotal trial, similar to a phase three study for drugs. Lower risk class one and two devices, such as wheelchairs, catheters, and contact lenses, can be approved via another pathway which requires what's known as a 510K submission. Typically, 510K approvals don't require any clinical data. However, in approximately 10% of these submissions, FDA does require a clinical study. Next slide, please. As you can see in this next slide, the steps required to design and conduct pharmaceutical and medical device studies are very similar. However, there are key differences in the trial timelines based on the duration of patient follow-up required by FDA to assess safety and efficacy, with most medical devices requiring longer-term safety oversight than drugs. When we look at the clinical trial costs down below, we see that these are similarly distributed across both industries, with the bulk of trial expenses being focused on clinical monitoring and study management. Next slide, please. Now, as Mike mentioned during his presentation, there has been a dramatic increase in the cost and complexity of clinical trials due to the increased level of evidence required by FDA. Today's clinical protocols have more endpoints, clinical assessments, and patient-reported outcomes than 10 years ago, which has increased the per-patient study cost by as much as 34%. Given this regulatory landscape, one of the biggest questions that farm and device companies care about is how much is my study going to cost? MICRA has categorized clinical trial cost drivers over the last 15 years, and if we look at the base of this pyramid, we see that there are three major factors that impact a clinical study's budget. Number one, the study duration, which is driven by how quickly sites can enroll patients. Number two, the total number of sites needed to meet the target enrollment. And number three, the number of monitoring visits required to verify all of this data. Fortunately, in recent years, the advent of telemedicine has allowed for advances in clinical trial execution that minimize the impact of each of these three major cost drivers. Next slide, please. With the rise of telemedicine capabilities, the traditional site-based research model has slowly started shifting and being replaced with so-called decentralized clinical trials, in which some or all of the traditional study visits can be conducted remotely as e-visits by having healthcare providers interact with patients in their homes, rather than having patients travel to a clinic or a hospital. Typically, patients who are looking to join a clinical trial had to find research sites within a reasonable travel distance from their homes, and so sponsors had to pay several hundred thousand dollars to maintain multiple sites with a wide geographic spread to maximize patient recruitment. However, with remote trials, all the data can be collected by one central research coordination site through a combination of three approaches. Telemedicine appointments using encrypted phone or video conferencing, home health visits by healthcare workers, or through direct data entry by patients using online diaries, surveys, and the types of remote monitoring devices that Nikki described in her presentation. With the data now being decentralized, monitoring visit costs are also dramatically reduced since CREs can perform remote monitoring from their home offices instead of traveling to monitor data at each site. Study startup timelines also are reduced since it takes far less time to get IRB approval and contract finalization at that one central research site. Next slide, please. 
Besides lowering study costs and startup timelines, decentralized trials also help sponsors in a number of other areas. Recruiting and involving participants is often the most difficult aspect of a clinical trial, with nearly 80% of studies failing to meet their target timelines. For traditional studies, recruitment relied principally on advertising to local patients when they came in to see a physician. However, in contrast, with remote study sponsors can engage advocacy groups and use social media campaigns to find patients all across the country. And now with the bulk of study participation being possible from the patient's home or on their devices while they're on the go, patients face fewer time and travel demands. And so people who would normally have declined to participate due to restrictions such as mobility issues, lack of childcare, upcoming vacations, or limited ability to take time off work are now willing to say yes. Virtual trials also speed up the enrollment and onboarding of participants. Informed consent procedures are much simpler since patients can access online study information and sign electronic consent forms. Investigational product logistics are also streamlined. Patients can be shipped the investigational drug from a pharmacy or be trained to use a new device in their homes by nurses or device representatives. Patient engagement and compliance also show dramatic improvements. As much as 40% of patients in traditional phase three trials lose interest and drop out of the study, which can have a devastating impact on the primary endpoint analysis. Remote trial platforms can overcome these study fatigue issues by keeping patients engaged and informed. Patients are able to see their progress in the study and get notifications about what tasks they need to perform next. They can also get reminders about any data that might be incomplete and thank you messages from the sponsor for helping make this research possible. Together, all these factors help improve their compliance and bring retention rates up to as high as 90 to 95%, which as you can imagine is incredibly appealing for a sponsor. Next slide, please. So as some of you have probably guessed, there are certain prerequisites for conducting virtual clinical trials, which many sponsors are now exploring to plan for trial continuity in the face of coronavirus limitations. One of the biggest upfront investments required for these trials is research-based software systems that can integrate data from a range of different Bluetooth or cloud-connected devices. Each of these systems must be easy to use and have HIPAA-compliant security features and audit trails since they're being used to gather health data, which means sponsors have to engage experienced digital health vendors. Next, sponsors have to think about the patient population to assess whether or not remote research would be a feasible alternative to a traditional study. In aging populations, for example, technology may be a barrier to participation or may even compromise the integrity of the data being collected. Third, sponsors have to consider the study design and evaluate whether all or part of the study is suitable for digital health interventions. They have to ask, are there remote sensor devices that can produce data comparable to standard in-person clinical assessments? Can lab work or radiographic images be collected by giving the patient a requisition to print and take to a core lab or imaging center? Can certain data be collected via e-diaries for convenience? As you start to think through these considerations, you can see that many studies may not be able to rely purely on virtual visits. For products such as devices that require a surgery for implantation, it's impossible to eliminate the initial physician interaction. The good news, though, is that in such cases, there is the option of setting up what are called hybrid clinical trials, where patients can have their pre-op evaluation and surgery in person, but thereafter, follow-up study visits can be performed remotely. This hybrid approach allows sponsors to leverage all the benefits and patient convenience of remote trials and still incentivize enrollment for patients who may not live close to the surgical center. Next slide, please. So having gone through an operational overview of planning remote trials, we thought it would be interesting to present a case study that would help demonstrate the dollar cost savings associated with hybrid clinical trials. This slide summarizes the major costs associated with an IDE study for a new cervical total disc replacement product. A study of this nature would typically require approximately 160 to 180 patients, and a sponsor would typically bring on about 16 sites to have the trial involved within two years. The total price tag for this would be roughly $8 million, with approximately 50% of the cost going towards study management and monitoring, and another 27 towards payments for the sites for conducting the study. Next slide, please. Using a budget forecasting model, we looked to see how clinical study line items would be impacted by transitioning to a hybrid trial design, 
whereby all visits after six months are conducted remotely. With a large volume of study data now being collected using a combination of telehealth appointments and EPROs, monitoring visit costs decreased by 20% and data management costs decreased by 30%. Data entry error rates also dropped from 60 errors per thousand data points to just 15 out of a thousand, which allows monitors and data managers to focus their time and efforts on more mission critical tasks than source document verification. Project management costs also go down due to site closeout and database lock timelines being reduced. And the stats analysis also decreases due to improved patient compliance and lower protocol deviation rates across the study. Aggregated together, the sponsors see a net saving of half a million dollars. Next slide, please. Coming back to the current pandemic and the road ahead, now more than ever, sponsors and sites need to be resourceful to keep ongoing trials running and avoid delays for new studies over the coming months. As you've now heard, AMA and CMS have endorsed the use of telemedicine services and are joined by the CDC and FDA, paving the way to take full advantage of decentralized clinical trials where feasible. FDA has also released a detailed guidance document in March on conducting clinical trials during COVID-19, which is available on their website and is a really valuable tool if you're planning to explore the option of transitioning your study to a remote setup. It has a useful, useful frequently answered questions section that answers compliance and operational issues and is updated every six weeks by uh, FDA based on their interactions with the industry on their current study, study challenges. Next slide, please. So to wrap up, given these present challenges, we want to share one more update from FDA. The FDA has also added flexibility to the requirements for collecting informed consent. In June, the agency went one step further and announced the endorsement of an app called COVID My Studies that's available free of charge in the Google and Apple app stores to help investigators and patients obtain electronic informed consent. To use the app, sponsors just need to register their study using the three steps described in the slide. Informed consent forms can then be sent securely to patients who automatically receive an electronic copy after signing. The investigator can also securely download the signed consent form and generate a printed copy for their study files all with the click of the button and the avoidance of any safety challenges that come with in-person interactions. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and I'll turn things back to Glenn to wrap up. Next slide. Thank you, Iman. So, so now what? COVID-19 has changed the way we look at everything from your day-to-day -day business activities to your clinical program and possibly your reimbursement strategy. How has the increase in digital trends impacted your business or even considering how various digital options can cut your costs and drive your clinical studies? As we embark into new innovation in the digital world and new methods of assessing and treating patients, the one thing we need to keep in mind is to maintain scientific integrity. This may seem obvious, but as we push the envelope on innovation, as we look to cut costs, the bar of safety and effectiveness must remain the same. However, we can do this and leverage FDA's flexibility. They are attempting to keep up with the speeding train of innovation, such as digital trends, uh, virtual clinical studies, and there are opportunities to get devices onto the market. The FDA is using pathways the market rarely utilized before. In addition, we are seeing more breakthrough designations, which Mike referenced, and faster approval than ever. We work with FDA almost daily on the rise of digital health and digital health technologies and educating them on new and less burdensome and ultimately less costly clinical protocols. In addition, we have seen new ways to manage and execute clinical studies, and all of these allow an ability to maintain that high scientific rigor, but at lower cost. What coronavirus has taught us is creating a business model as well as new technologies and procedures around value. We need not to be so reactionary. We need to keep the momentum going on preventative treatment opportunities and focus on these trends such as digital health and integration and study design that will allow us to continue to transform management of patient data, reimbursement, and ultimately the business. Next slide. So thank you. To all the attendees, thank you to X Talks. Uh, this concludes the presentation. We can take questions and answers uh, now and hope everyone stays safe and stays healthy. Thank you.
Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you very much, Glenn, Nikki, Lauren, Michael, and Iman for that very insightful and timely presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Now I would like to invite our audience members to continue sending in their questions, just like Glenn said, uh, right now using the questions window for the Q&A portion of the webinar. I've already received some questions already, so I'm going to start with those. So here's our first question. How can informed consent be obtained from patients when they are unable to come in for clinical visits? This is Iman, I'm going to answer that one. This is a really great, quite great question and one that we've been asked pretty frequently um, since the onset of this pandemic. While um, there is a lot of added flexibility in the FTA's uh, eyes, there are some GCP fundamentals that still stand. Um, as I mentioned during my presentation in June, FDA endorsed the use of a new free COVID My Studies app for e-consent, which automates the back and forth signature process and saves the final digital copy for both parties. Um, for sponsors or sites who may not be comfortable with the idea of using an app and going the digital route, there is still an option of using traditional consent methods with remote delivery and signature. So based on the guidance that FDA released in March, sites are permitted to use either mail, email or fax to send a blank copy of the ICF to the patient in lieu of having them come in to review the consent in person. The site can then conduct a detailed consent discussion with the patient via phone or video, leaving enough time for Q&A with the patient to make sure they understand their trial obligations and what it means to participate in the research study. This is you know, a GCP requirement again and has not been waived and still have to be documented in the EMR um, by the site with the date and time of the consent discussion and the fact that it was done virtually. And as long as I coordinate the NAS that the patient mail, email, or fax a signed copy back to them and sends the patient a fully signed version for their records, the FDA is completely comfortable with remote informed consent through either of these two methods. Okay, thank you. Here's our next question. Are there any guidelines for the use of video conferencing during clinical trial telehealth visits? Thanks, Sonia. That's a, another great question, one that we're starting to get asked pretty frequently. This is Iman again. So based on FDA's guidance, we know that the FDA doesn't endorse any specific platforms for remote visits, but it's best to use a secure encrypted telehealth platform and not something like Google Hangouts or Skype. If this is the first time that the PI will be conducting a telehealth appointment and if they're unfamiliar with the process, it's the sponsor's obligation to make sure they conduct study training and document the date and scope of the training to show to an inspector in the event of a future site audit. The guidance also mentions that uh, when conducting the visit, the visit should be set up in a way that protects the patient's privacy, and so the PI's family members shouldn't be present in the background, for example. The setting needs to mimic the one-on-one -on -one privacy of a closed exam room at the clinic. And the guidance furthermore asks that the patient and PI confirm each other's identity before starting the conversation, and that the date and location of both parties be noted in the source for each such visit. Um, one other final note, some telehealth platforms allow for a video recording of the session, which can be embedded in the patient's EMR record and save for the monitor or FD inspector to review upon request. This is a really nice feature and obviously great to enable where possible, but not something that's required. But I did want to share that there are platforms out there with that capability. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, we have another question here. It's a little long, uh, and here I go with it. Do you see any trend toward using digital health to support providers giving remote care? For example, having a remote expert level physician connecting with an in-person home health nurse to help assess and advise complex patient care needs in real time? So this is Vicki. That's an interesting question, and I, I think that that is not quite a trend that I'm personally seeing. I think I'll talk on two trends that I am, maybe why that's not a trend. Uh, currently, a lot of the emerging technologies are what I would, some of them are what I would classify as passive monitoring. They're trying to come up with ways to integrate monitoring into activities or devices that we interact with every day, like a watch or a phone or something that's really low profile. The other thing I'm seeing is an expansion of the parameters that are actually being monitored. So there's a good understanding of the types of diseases that are reasonable or have precedent at the agency with what they find acceptable to be remotely monitored. And through the advancement of different sensor technology, as well as our understanding of just basic physiology, 
how we can uh, expand the amount of data we can get from remote monitoring. And to touch upon kind of the, the heart of the question, which is um, more of this high acuity patient population, I think there are some challenges associated with that in terms of remote care. I think firstly, it has to do with the education of these physicians and healthcare workers and how to interact with digital health solutions. And that really ties into the usability, user experience, and user interface of these systems, as well as the safety of it. As I touched upon cybersecurity earlier and how we need reliable sources and secure networks um, to, to actually provide care. And I think most importantly, why that particular trend might not be something right now we're seeing is because the the risks associated with latency and treatment or action taken for these complex, possibly very sick patients that um, are typically subject to real-time monitoring or uh, something like a bedside monitor in ICU. So I think as technology advances and as the use of remote monitoring increases, the palette of the agency to permit uh, remote monitoring of patients who require higher acuity um, care, I think we can continue, we'll, we'll possibly see a trend in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Here's the next question. How a manufacturer's response can be drafted with that rationale to respond to FDA, which are sufficient or release burdensome response? Hi, Sonia. This is Glenn. Um, I'll I'll take that one, and if, if Mike wants to jump in, he can. You know, the, <clears throat> excuse me. The definition of least burdensome is one of those questions I think we'll be searching for for a long time because uh, it's so subjective. And I like to approach that question when responding to FDA, not necessarily with least burdensome, but maybe appropriately burdensome. So we, you have to take into consideration. Uh, what data you have that drives the pathway that you're trying to negotiate uh, or argue for. Um, if it's getting out of a test, uh, preclinical test, or having a least burdensome clinical study, why is it least burdensome? What information goes in to validating that particular statement? Um, so it takes, you know, it's a pretty complex uh you know, two words, least burdensome, because it takes into so much other factors to really educate the FDA and prove that indeed it is a least burdensome approach to take a certain pathway to market. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, we have a question here for Michael John, uh, and this audience member says, thanks for the insight. Uh, could you summarize your thinking on the drivers for the shift on valid scientific evidence? Sure. So, so it's a good question. I think for, for some time historically, you know, a lot of device innovation went outside of the U.S. first. And, you know, as I said in, during my, my talk, I think a lot of criticism was placed on the agency for not being able to make those devices available to the U.S. population, you know, first. And, you know, I think in combination with some, some innovations at the FDA, the, the early feasibility program, um, the breakthrough designation program, and I think the agency's adoption of the, the shared risk concept. Um, I think just generally the U.S. has become a more attractive location for innovation. You know, if you dovetail that with some of the tightening of the regulations overseas with NDR and the size of the market in the U.S., I think it's just kind of a, a natural shift towards finding more streamlined approaches to getting those devices to market. And that's sort of caused that, I think, redefinition of how the agency and, and others view the, the whole concept of valid scientific evidence. Okay, thank you. Let's see if we can squeeze in a couple more questions here. Uh, this one here looks like it's for Lauren. Uh, would payers also consider clinical data such as previous RCT data collected from the EU or other countries to support coverage policies due to the slow clinical study progress in U.S. due to the COVID-19? Uh, great question. So there haven't been any, uh, I guess, regulations or policies or guidelines kind of relaxed because of the COVID pandemic in, in this um, scenario, but U.S. payers will often consider um, OUS data, including assessments that were performed by NICE in the U.K. Um, however, it is really imperative that 
uh, organizations and commercial entities really understand what's required by the FDA for approval. Um, and then also by the uh, stakeholders such as, you know, CMS or even the uh, CPT editorial panel if they are pursuing a different reimbursement pathway. So in short, uh, payers do um, consider OUS data. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. And it looks like we've come to the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. So we'll, I'd like to thank everyone for those questions. Uh, as I said, we have reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. If we couldn't attend to your questions, the team at the team at MICRA, MEMCRA, are happy to follow up with you after this presentation. If you have any further questions, please direct them to the email address that's on your screen. And you can call 202-552. I'm sorry, um, 5800, or email info at mcra.com. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated, as it will help us to improve on our further webinars. Now, I'm about to send you a link in your chat box. You'll be able to view the recording of this event at that link, and also share this link with your colleagues when they register for the recording as well. So I encourage you to do that. Now, please join us in thanking our speakers Glenn, Nikki, Michael, Lauren and Amon from MCRA for that very insightful presentation. We hope you found this webinar informative. It has been my pleasure to be your webinar moderator. On behalf of the team here at Xtalks, we thank you for joining us. I'm Sonia Hunt. Until next time, please take care and bye for now.